Kirk Cousins in the Hall of Fame. What to expect from Cam Dantzler and who would win between elephants and hippos? It's Twitter Tuesday here on the Locked On Vikings podcast. You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everybody? Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Locked On Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, your pal, and the kid you copied off in math class. My name is Luke Braun. You can find me on Twitter at Luke Braun NFL. Shows on Twitter at Locked On Vikings. Thank you so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day. And I encourage you to go check out my Twitter page right now. Go to at Luke Braun NFL on Twitter and check out the pinned tweet. There's something pretty cool over there that I want to make sure that y'all know about. So it's Twitter Tuesday, which means I am answering your questions today. If you ever have questions for me, you can always send them to me at Luke Braun NFL or at Lockdown Vikings on Twitter. You can send an email to Lockdown Vikings podcast at gmail.com. You can fill out the Google form, which is in the show notes. Not too many questions. It's July. We're all a little sleepy. I get it. But that means I get to spend a little more time on each one. And sometimes I like that. So let me start with one that does require a bit more of a long-winded answer. It's from Kurt with two C's. And he asks, did you know that the Vikings would have went 15-2 and two if Zimmer's sleepy defense didn't give up any points at the end of both halves in every game? How hard could that have possibly been since teams are basically not playing football during those periods of time? So there's a bunch of angles to this. I don't know what you mean uh, by like teams are not playing football during those periods of time. That I mean, I don't, I don't get that. like it's a different world. They're playing like more like prevent defenses or something. I don't know what you mean there. Um, but yeah, so that's a stat that's been flying around about like how the the two minute defense was so bad under Zimmer. I don't think that's the best way to put it because. Here's the deal. Somebody else did that the other way around. Like if the offense scored on every possession, they would have been uh, at the end of halves, they would have been 13 and four. Well, it's like, yeah, because you added two touchdowns a game. Yeah, they would have been pretty good. Um, But the Vikings in 2021, their end of their, their two minute defense. So end of both halves was worse than we've ever seen an NFL team do in history by like a lot, I think. Uh, I or, or going back to like ninety four or whatever, like the data goes back. It was, I, we use historically bad as a term too much. This was historically bad. This set history. It was so bad. So I don't think even saying, oh, they would have been fifteen and two, like it would have won them a few extra games. No, they at times found a way to give up multiple touchdowns within two minutes. The problems there are immense. Some of it was situational stuff, right? Like, you know, Mike Zimmer messing up with a timeout or something like that. Some of it was situational stuff with Kirk Cousins, you know. It's uh, third and six and the clock is running and, you know, you threw four yards over the middle or or second and six and the clock is running and because it's second and six, you don't have to throw at the sticks so you'll throw inside but the clock will keep running. Um, Or conversely, you know, stuff where the clock should not keep running it should stop but then you throw one like a toe tapper to the sideline and it stopped that kind of thing and Kirk Cousins and like situational awareness has always been a big critique that I have of him um so that's part of it with the offense that said I mean he like led drives that scored and that's great um but there was always there would always be those sort of things on the periphery things we would kill Mike Zimmer for like not doing I I always see that as like a a thing on the periphery for coaching. And he was not good at it. It was just never the biggest deal to me. And it's not the biggest deal to me with Kirk Cousins, but like as a quarterback, it is something that's like pretty annoying. Um, So that's part of it. But again, part of it was just bad defensive play calling, a lot of off coverage. A lot of that was the corners not feeling very confident, not playing very confidently. Um, If you remember in Zimmer's old defense, uh, cornerbacks could choose off or press coverage depending on a myriad factors, but it was their decision to make. And so if they felt like they needed to give up um, cushion to to cover the guy, they were given the leeway to do that. And so you had like Cameron Dantzler and Bashad Breeland playing off every damn snap, even when it was, you know, third and two. Um, that was a, a huge reason for the problems 
that they experienced inside two minutes. And then you had stuff like the Lions game where they just played all sorts of keep it in front of you and tackle. And they gave up nine yards over and over and over again. And that was a real, I mean, I was already ready to fire Mike Zimmer there, but I think that was the true final straw for uh, there's no redeeming after that. Um, but it, you know, that you, the, the, it, it cuts both ways. The defense would give up a score and then the offense would go three and out so quickly that the defense would have to make another stop and then they'd fail to do so. And so you actually would get multiple scores inside the same two minute drill, uh, that was, it, it was, it was unbelievably awful. So like, how do you fix it? I don't know. You have to fix like 10 things. There's so many things that made that so bad and wrong, um, that, a lot of it was Zimmer's fault. Some of it is Cousins' fault, and he's coming back. Some of it was just Cameron Dantzler's fault. He's coming back, right? Like, he's still playing. More on him later. Um, so some of it, I think, is naturally fixed, but I do think we sort of have fallen into a trap. I think the Vikings themselves a little bit have fallen into the trap of saying, well, we got rid of the bad coach. Everything should be good now. And um, nope, sorry, y'all. There were problems with Zimmer, but there's a lot more going on with that. And I hope they don't get complacent and think that just getting rid of Zimmer and putting in some McVay guy will fix the whole thing of all the Viking stuff, because that's not really how anything ever works. Harbs for Prez asks, is Kirk Cousins a Hall of Famer? I don't know where this came from, um, but there's it's been going around on Twitter a little bit, and so this is a bit of a joke question. Somebody in the comments of something was like, is Kirk Cousins a Hall of Famer, and did a poll. And it was, I believe, in the comments of a tweet about Kirk Cousins and like his yards per game or something. Um, so I, I think it was a lot of Kirk Cousins fans in the replies to it. Either way, the poll was, is Kirk Cousins a Hall of Famer? And it was like 54% yes, which like, y'all... What? What are you looking at? Let's have a talk, all right? Uh, Kirk Cousins is, at best, Hall of Very Good, but I don't think so. That's where, like, Philip Rivers goes, and I'm sorry, but no. Um, I, what I'm guessing is that people are looking at, like, career passing yards or something, which, if you don't era adjust, you get all sorts of wacky things. You get Kirk Cousins over Cam Newton, um, also over guys like Kurt Warner and Sonny Jurgensen. Like, there's a whole bunch of really good quarterbacks from back in the day, Len Dawson, Terry Bradshaw, who just don't have as many yards because it was a different era. And if you don't era adjust, like what are you, you're just kind of saying all modern quarterbacks are better than all older quarterbacks, which while that might be true, doesn't really help us differentiate for questions like who should make the hall of fame. Plus you get all sorts of wacky stuff. You get Andy Dalton and Ryan Fitzpatrick in the hall of fame. If you do that. And I don't think y'all want that. Um, I like, I don't think you believe that total yards should put you in the hall of fame. Like, I don't think you're willing to defend everything that that implies. You're going to get, uh, like, Dave Krieg in before <laughs> you get Jim Kelly in. Like, get out of here. So, no, Kirk Cousins is not a Hall of Famer. I'm sorry. The Hall of Fame is a legacy place. It's so hard to get into the Hall of Fame because your legacy needs to be as one of the greats, one of the all-time Mount Rushmore, you know, peak of everything. What is Kirk Cousins' legacy? If he were to retire today, his legacy would be that dude was exactly 500 as a quarterback. His legacy is medium, is just being okay. Not terrible, not the worst quarterback you've ever seen, but not great. Just okay, just fine. Just you can do it. He'll he'll do. Uh, maybe you can upgrade on him later, but he'll work. That does not get you in the Hall of Fame. That gets you in the Hall of Mid. Uh, so I've got a lot more questions to get to. I only got to a couple questions there. Uh, but again, lighter mailbag, so we'll get through all of them. So uh, that will be all fine. But first, let me talk to you about Dave. Dave is a banking app that can help you get extra cash right away, especially if you're in a pinch. It can really come in clutch. It's like a gift from future you. Um, Dave was invented because of overdraft fees and overdraft fee, like how bad are overdraft fees? With Dave, you can avoid those overdraft fees if you need to... Uh, pick up a birthday present, or you have some unforeseen expense, or you're just waiting for your paycheck to come in, your paycheck's a day late, now you got to pay rent and all that stuff. Don't deal with the overdraft fees. That is exactly what Dave is for. You can tackle those expenses without stressing out, and there are no hang-ups. So if you're in a pinch, you need some extra help, download Dave, and think of it as a gift from future you. Download the Dave app, D-A-V-E, from the App Store right now. Sign up for an extra cash account and get up to $500 instantly. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. Instant transfer fees apply. Banking provided by Evolve. Member FDIC. Future you will thank you. 
Hey, so right now at the Locked On NFL podcast, we're doing the top 50 most valuable players as listed out by Bet Online. Um, Ross Jackson and I on the Tuesday episode reacted, and there are two different Vikings in the one that re- we reacted to. So go check that out. Um, and we also had one day, one day we will do Dalvin Cook versus Alvin Kamara. One day. Uh, we got very close to doing it, but it's also a very fun one. A lot of Denny Green talk. I managed to shoehorn it into Locked On NFL. Go check it out. Uh, moving on with this Twitter Tuesday mailbag, however, thank you so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day. The next one comes from Bradley Knorr, who says, can you explain what the veteran minimum is and how exactly a veteran minimum deal works? I see, player, I see news about players signing vet min deals, but never really know what's involved in that. Okay, so on the you just want to follow the team 101 level, a veteran minimum deal is a very, very cheap deal that is literally the minimum amount that you can pay a player. You can't pay a player $1 um, because that would obviously be like some sort of collusion. So the union has basically negotiated. You can play, you, you have to pay players at least this much. What that amount is is not a set amount. It depends on how many years you've been in the league, how many accrued seasons you have, but it ranges somewhere between three quarters of a million and like 1.2 million. So we're talking about nickels here in terms of a three-year veteran minimum or a four-season veteran minimum. We're talking about totally nickels and dimes, and you don't need to worry too much about it. Um, If you Google NFL veteran minimum, you'll find like charts that say, you know, how much it is for four years, five years, six years, or whatever. Um, Go ahead and peruse that if you want. But what you need to understand is that like every year you accrue in the league, if you become a free agent and a team wants to sign you, they have to pay at least X, and X goes up by like 80 grand for every year you're in the league, more or less. Um, Yeah, that's kind of it. But veteran minimum you can just think of as okay that guy's not on a rookie deal he's not like a restricted free agent um and we are paying him literally as little as it is legal to pay him and those vet min deals usually go out to players who are older or a little washed or have for whatever reason have no negotiating leverage and they just kind of have to be happy to be on a team and then you go okay you're just happy to be here i'm not paying you any more than the league is literally making me the vikings did a lot of that last year with all their one-year deals and stuff rorschach cousins asks what is your ideal nfl streaming service and how much are you willing to pay per month so right now Um, I think NFL Game Pass should just be adapted to be a place where you can pick a team and get the games for that team. You pay $100 a year. You only get one team, right? You can't watch, go watch all the games. You can still watch like coaches film and stuff. But all I, I would pay way more than $100 a year if I could just go to NFL.com and say, I'm a Vikings fan. I would like to watch all the Vikings games. I'd probably pay like 600 bucks a year for that, honestly. Like I would pay quite a bit because that would probably still be less than what it would cost to get like a cable subscription or um, some other gigantic TV package when literally the only live TV events that I ever want to watch are football games. (laughs) So just let me watch just the football games or just the Vikings games. Uh, But until the NFL puts out a package that's usable and makes sense, um, Ahoy, mateys. Uh, Pace asks, with the amount of resources teams are putting toward analytics, why are there still so many first round busts through the league every year? Um, the easy answer that's not going to be very satisfying. It's hard, man. The draft is impossible. Like if you've been following the league for any number of years, I challenge you go find a social media post. You made some March, maybe early April from just a couple years ago about some player you fell in love with and probably forgot about. And I'm not talking about, you know, the blue chip, like, Oh, I'm super in love with Kayvon Thibodeau. Like, okay, great. Good for you. He went fifth overall. And if he works out, excellent. Good job. Um, but I'm talking about, you know, the ones that people really, really pine over, that are end up being like third round picks or whatever two years and out of the league. So often guys that we get super obsessed with the one I always go back to is Will Hernandez Vikings, Twitter and Vikings fandom in general got unbelievably obsessed with Will Hernandez. And right now giants fans want to kick him to the curb. They want to fire that guy into the moon. Um, it's just hard. 
like half of first round picks don't pan out and less than that many second round picks pan out. And I think part of it is you just can never know how a guy's going to transition from college to the NFL. It's a vastly different world. It's, it's, uh, it's more work. It's like more rigor. In some ways it's less rigor. It's more pressures in some ways, less pressures in some ways. It's so different that some guys just do not adapt and just flame out because they just can't quite get their heads wrapped around this or that. You can't predict injuries. There's just stuff you can't predict. Like analytics is not a cure-all. And I would even say, you said with so many resources being uh, put into analytics, I don't know if there is that many. I mean, it's like the biggest analytics teams are like eight people strong. Like they're hiring teams of like eight math people. That's not like pouring a crap load of resources into analytics. Now, we have a better sense of how fast a guy is with analytics, right? Because we have tracking data and we, we can do better than a 40 yard dash now. You know, we have a better sense from analytics of, um, you know, what sort of schemes players played in or because we have tracking data or, you know, we have all sorts of other tools to better answer questions. But like the question, how fast is that player? Even if we can answer it way, way, way better than we used to be able to isn't any more useful than it used to be. And every position, even you know wide receivers, need to be more than just fast. We've known that for a while, right? So there's always going to be unknowns and untangibles that are going to cause things like the third overall pick not being very good and then the fourth overall pick is a superstar. It happens all the time. It's basically unavoidable. And the draft is closer to random chance than it is some kind of controlled thing where some teams are better than others. Um, and that is actually pretty analytically backed. That's part of what makes it fun, and it's what makes the draft engaging. It's part of what makes the NFL a good product, but if you see it as some like predetermined, predictable thing that if you don't predict it perfectly, you've failed in some way, uh, I think you're going to end up disappointed more often than not. I've got a few more questions to get to, but first, let me talk to you about Built Bar. They have done the unthinkable. They have taken their coconut brownie chunk, their best flavor, bar none. It's great. There's all sorts of like different textures, different flavors, coconut and chocolate. Who doesn't love that? Covered in 100% chocolate. And it's all, everything at Built Bar. Low calorie, low sugar, low fat, chock full of collagen protein, which your body absorbs better and it's awesome. They've taken this coconut brownie chunk, this beautiful, perfect thing, and they've done their Built Puffs treatment to it. It is now a marshmallowy, coconutty brownie chunk puff. It is just an affront to God and it's so good. <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> so if you want to get that or any of their regular protein bars, all the main series flavors are always available, chocolate, raspberry, chocolate, mint, that kind of stuff, you can go to built.com. Just make sure you use promo code LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5. You can get 15% off of your order. That is at built.com. Moving right along with this Twitter Tuesday mailbag. The next question I'm answering comes from Lock to Mini, who asks, if you could pick one backup QB in the NFL to be Kirk Cousins' QB2, who would it be? Who would be the most fun, logic and nuance aside? There's no wrong answer, but there is a right one. <laughs> All right, Lock to Mini. I will engage this on your terms. You are asking me if Drew Lock to the Vikings as a backup to Kirk Cousins would be a good idea. Um, yeah, absolutely he would be qualified to be a backup my hesitance is he might be overqualified to be a backup I think he might be a low-end starter high-end backup kind of guy um so yeah hell yeah for sure um and Jesus Christ Seattle find God don't rely on Drew Locke to be your actual starter what are you doing um but the so Drew Locke is a very boomer bust quarterback, right? He's got a lot of, he takes a lot of chances. Some of them are really bad. So he's going to have four interception games and he's also going to have games where he bombs really cool deep passes, right? In a backup, that kind of variance might be what you want. If you're starting a backup quarterback, you kind of want to live on, by the sword and die by the sword. If you have a really conservative backup that loves to get 182 yards, you'll just never win the game. But it doesn't matter if you lose the game by more. So yeah, take the risk. What do you have to lose? You're probably losing the game anyways. Let's go YOLO about it and raise variance. That's how underdogs should behave. Um, and I think Drew Locke really plays into that. I think he'd be, yeah, a, a lovely backup for anybody. Sure, absolutely. Why the heck not? Um, but if we're talking about actual backups that would be available... I don't know where Chase Daniels playing. He's always my answer to this, though. I really like him as a backup because I think he's 
he can pretty much execute anything and he's he is a little more conservative. I mean, he is not the guy that's going to take a million chances and YOLO his way into four touchdowns and four interceptions, you know, Jameis Winston style. Um, but he can execute things well. He can throw an accurate pass and I think you can make a game winning game plan out of that. Uh, Zach Walters asks, what's going on with Cam Dantzler? Will we see more of him in year three, do you think, or is he going to get buried on the depth chart? I think he's de facto cornerback two right now in OTAs. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, if they've been, um, if, if they've seen it or differently or something like that. But with Andrew Booth out, um, Cameron Dantzler has been the starter and Andrew Booth probably has to take that job from him. And then Patrick Peterson's the starter opposite. So I think Cam Dantzler right now has a starting job, like a, a full on starting job. And it's a matter of the, the rookies, Caleb Evans and Andrew Booth, how well do they play in camp? And what sort of rotation does that justify? How many snaps they earn will eat into Cameron Dantzler's snaps. That's where we're at. So will it be a bigger role or not? Kind of depends on camp. My guess would be probably, I mean, rookie corners are never going to be that good right away. And um, I, I do think that this scheme will be better than better for Cameron Dantzler than Zimmer's was. Um, so I, I would guess yes, but I mean, I'm, get, I'm, I'm making a prognostication here. It's, it's far, far, far from, from anything set in stone. It's going to come down to camp is the real answer to your question. Alex Schultz asks, how many years do you think Thielen can still be productive? He's been my favorite player for years, and I'm wondering how much longer he has. I believe he has aged to a point where he can kind of be sustained here for as many years as he he wants to play till he retires, as, as long as his body kind of holds up and he still feels like he can. He's 31, man. I mean, we're not putting him out to pasture. He's not 36. He's not, you know, a gray beard yet. Like 31, you still can do stuff in this league. Um, but he's not going to be a burner. He does not have, I, I would not imagine he can run the four, four that he ran when he was a rookie. Right. Um, but he's a phenomenal red zone weapon. So there's all that's excellent. Right. So you're going to have the, all he does is catch touchdowns thing. It reminds me of older Chris Carter, um, who was great in the red zone and his speed wasn't all there anymore, but you had Randy Moss in his prime. So who cared? But it's, you know, he's, he can catch everything that comes in his way. He knows how to run a route. He can be really savvy. There's kind of always a place for that, even if it doesn't have the, the speed. I think it, I always said he would age gracefully. I believe he has. I believe he has aged gracefully, and now he is who he is. He's not going to be a 1,500-yard receiver or anything like that, um, but he'll, he'll be there, probably worth being wide receiver too until his body starts giving out. And it's just going to be a matter of how many games do you get him for? Can he stay healthy? Um, but we went over that a, a few episodes ago and I'm not like crazy concerned and not any more than I would be for any 30, some 30 plus wide receiver. Um, how much longer does he have? I do think he has a, like more than two years in him. Um, and then the decline will happen and we'll kind of see if we we're still interested and does the money work out and stuff. And maybe he does a random retirement tour beer in Jacksonville or something. Who cares? Glenn Charlesworth asks, what can Kevin O'Connell do scheme wise to help Bradbury with pass blocking? He's got bad anchor. Okay. So to help a, uh, struggling center is in particular with bull rushes, right? That's what we're struggling with. That's the anchor thing. Um, essentially you have to redo your protections. This is a much more in-depth thing. Um, there is an article I wrote over last season about protections and like the basics of how they work. It's a lot more of a system than you block that guy, you block that guy, you block that guy. It's how do you respond to fronts and stuff like that. But essentially the goal is to keep Garrett Bradbury out of one-on-ones with nose tackles. Give him a guard, give him help, turn protections with a little bit more. What that means is leaving tackles on an island but we might be able to do that. Like, I'm okay with leaving Brian O'Neill on an island. He can do that. Or or even maybe even Darisoff. Darisoff can take a, take a step forward. That would be great. But it's about changing the protections. And also, there's something about mid-zone versus wide zone, um, which is a change the Vikings seem to have made here. Wide zone, they're going a lot more outside, a lot more. You're using a lot more, um, you know, running to the side. And that's the same is true in play action. Whereas mid-zone... It might be a little bit easier to hide uh, play action passes. It might be a little bit easier to, to deceive and, and, and a little bit more straight up, a little bit more condensed on the, especially in the interior of the line. And that can give Bradbury a little bit more help. If you have a, a, a if you're taking a bull rush from a guy who is bigger than you, some of that's technique, but a lot of that is being able to set to one side 
if the other side is covered, if you've got a guard over there, you can set to one side and then maybe get a better angle, get better leverage, that kind of stuff. And it also sounds like he's trying to put on weight. So those are all the reasons that if Garrett Bradbury were to take a step forward, those are the things we would point to. Um, and it sounds like they're going to give him, you know, a fair, a fair shot to win a contract and he's going to be the starter at center, um, without any competition. So, yeah. Uh, that brings me to Jeff Douglas saying, based on the weaknesses of the roster, which position do you believe is most likely to see a veteran added? And who would that be? Um, not center. (laughs) Maybe you think they should, and that's totally valid, but they're not going to. Um, it's the the defensive line, not interior defensive line, not like Daniel Hunter edge rusher, but something in between what we would kind of previously have known as like a three tech, a Sheldon Richardson type. And maybe there is a reunion with Sheldon Richardson on the horizon. Um, there's of course been talks with Ndama Kong Su. I think he would play that role very, very well. I think it's that, um, I think they're good on linebacker depth. They drafted a linebacker, even though they have, they drafted like a fast coverage linebacker, even though they have Troy Dye and Chaz Surratt, uh, on the roster, which does not bode well for those guys. So I think that group's done. I, you could always use a corner. You could always use a wide receiver. I'm of the mind. You can never have too many of either. Um, you could use a backup quarterback like we kind of talked about before. But I think the real need right now is like if they're going to do a 5-1 with five defensive linemen and Eric Kendricks, you're putting Armin Watts in a starting role on that. And I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. I would, I would like to at least give him competition. If not, bring in like a Sheldon Richardson that can just be that guy. Skull Trade 87 asks, who would have a better chance of winning on The Voice, Andrew Booth or Blake Prohl? So, both of these guys have awesome voices. It is so close. I agonized over this. Like, I really took time to decide, and I do not have a confident decision. I erred toward Prohl. I, I don't know. Something about it is a little fuller. There's a little bit more. There's like a, uh, a vibrato to Andrew Booth that I think is a little bit forced. Um but I also am not musically talented at all. So what the hell do I know? I don't know. I'm going with Blake Prohl. Kalabunga Kev asks, three elephants versus three hippos. Who wins? It's the hippos. They have a killer instinct, and I think they have the meat and the muscle to take an elephant down. Now, if you said, like, hyenas versus elephants, there are all those videos of, like, lions or hyenas trying to take down an elephant, and the thing's just too big, and they just can't. I think a hippo could, especially if we're talking about, like, a hippo that has been instructed to fight and wants to fight. Um, that like a hippo could take down an elephant. And I think three V three, the elephants would definitely have an intelligence advantage. Um, but I don't know if that would extend to the point where they would like employ tactics, like real tactics. And I don't know what an intelligence advantage can do because I don't know how, I, I know how an elephant could possibly kill a hyena, right? If they could get like their step on it the right way or something. I don't know how you could do that with a hippo. Hippos have enough size and enough ferocity. I think they would take the elephants down. That is a great Twitter Tuesday question to end things on. Remember, go check out my pinned tweet, all right? And make sure you're uh, keeping an eye on my Twitter account on Saturday for uh, the next installment. It's very cute. I will see you all tomorrow. And as always, skull.